Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our CXO series here at NYSE. The Cube plus NYSE Wired. Two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage with CEOs, CISOs, chief executive officers, and more. I'm really excited to have Sonny Singh here, who is executive vice president and general manager of the Oracle Financial Services business. Sonny, great to see you. Ringing the bell this morning, how'd that feel? Oh, it's always exciting. Firstly, really glad to be here. It's always exciting to come back to the NYSE. And uh, this morning, um, we actually, uh, you know, rang the bell to celebrate our, our customers in financial services, uh, solutions that we have launched. And uh, I was delighted to bring some of our, our customers along for that. We had uh, Toronto Dominion Bank. We had uh, um, uh, the Navy Federal Credit Union. We had Citizens Bank. We had Guardian Life. And uh, and and other customers uh, that we were we were able to interact with, and by the way, just a year ago we were celebrating our tenth year anniversary for our listing on NYSE. So this is right on the heels of that. So you know, confluence of great events. Yes, yeah, Safra was here last year, ringing Correct. the bell, as she, I recall. Yes, absolutely. And of course, we just saw you guys out at Oracle uh, Cloud World. Yeah. Um, it seems like quite some time ago, but so much has happened since then. But. Yes. It was really amazing show. I mean, there were there were many, many tens of thousands of people there. I would guess twenty five thousand plus. Larry, of course, spoke. Safra spoke. You had customers up on stage. It was it was quite remarkable. And we went through. I was there as the analyst, and yeah. we went through the full stack, and Excellent. it was great. And one of the most interesting pieces of that stack was what's happening at the application layer, and then of course specifically your world of banking. So what do you see happening in banking? Wow, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things uh, that you always hear about banks just being technology companies with a banking license, sure. right? So, so we have a tremendous amount of intersection in the way we think about technology and the way banks think about technology. I think probably one of the industries where that is the most relevant component uh, of, uh, of of a bank's infrastructure, if you really think about it. You know, outside of a checkbook, a credit card, and a debit card, there's really no other physical product in banking, right? Everything is technology. So, you know, it, we fit in there like a, a, a hand and glove kind of arrangement. So uh, we are seeing so many things continuing to evolve. Um, the fact that banks have uh, this huge reliance on technology made them a very early adopter of technology. Unfortunately, that came with the downside. And the downside is that they built a lot of their applications, you know, multiple decades ago in the 70s and 80s. And this was the time where the internet wasn't a commercial idea. You, you didn't have any mobility uh, or mobile technologies. You did not have any social technologies. You did not have internet of things, IoT, any of the transformational technologies that we take for granted now those didn't exist at the time. So now we are here looking at AI and AI was just a research paper back then, right? So, so a lot of these banks are sitting on legacy infrastructure that you know, was built at a time when none of the fast moving transformational technologies were available. And so they have a huge challenge ahead of them to modernize. And this is one of the key things that we are seeing. The second thing we are seeing with banks is because of that, their competition is changing. They're getting, uh, you know, their uh, key services around payments and lending eaten away by fintechs, by big techs, and a whole new brand of uh, banks, neo banks, and over the top banking uh, organizations. So we are seeing all of this happen. Uh, again, I'm giving you a long answer. The other thing we are seeing is regulations and, and compliance. Uh, these are things that are just they keep them up at night, including cybersecurity. A lot of their uh, investment is going in stabilizing those areas. So the opportunity to invest in transforming the bank gets diminished. So these are all of the things that we are seeing banks deal with right you now. You know, it's funny, you, you say the things we take for granted. I'll give you a quick little story. My credit card just got hacked, like today. And I was I was down in South Carolina at a wedding this weekend. Of course, my credit card was all over South Carolina. My so somebody obviously grabbed it. And I know this bank, I know they're running Oracle, yeah. um, but you think about fraud detection 10 or 15 years ago, you'd have to go through your statements, maybe you'd find it, maybe you wouldn't. I got a text, I got an email, I got a phone call, spent a little bit of time on the phone with them, I'm having a new card sent out, they're blocking that, and, and so that's, I know it's 
Exadata and Oracle database and yeah. you know, Oracle applications. So thank you, All by right. the way, <laughs> for, for protecting me. But we take that for granted. The time to catch fraud now, like you said, in this distributed world, it gets compressed you know, down to nothing. So you've got to know your customer. A lot of challenges. You've got to know your customer. You have to be able to respond to them. You have to have an infrastructure to be able to to you know, verify who it is and make sure that, that that transaction actually is fraudulent and do so in near real time. Those are big challenges. How do you see banks like adopting things like cloud? Because yeah. early on, they were very much sort of against cloud. They were, actually, some tried to build their own cloud and realized yeah. maybe that's not such a good idea. And even, you know, Larry early on, people misunderstood, I think, what he said about cloud early on. Well, it's just servers and databases, et cetera. Now you guys have a world-class cloud. How are banks leaning in to, to OCI generally and, and cloud? So there's a lot packed into that question and I'll try and unpack it um, in, in kind of sequence. So you mentioned security and fraud detection mm. and I'll come back to the cloud, you know, leveraging that a little bit. So uh, firstly at Oracle, we are obsessed. Thank you for, for, for uh, for passing on your thanks, um, yeah. but at Oracle, we are totally obsessed about security. Mm. I don't know if you know this, but our first customer was actually the CIA, CIA. and oh, other three-letter intelligence <laughs> agencies that nobody talks about. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we got grounded in the notion of mission critical and highly, highly super secret confidential information. So we had to build for that from the get-go, which means that you need an obsession with everything from uh, making sure that the infrastructure is secure, the, the data is secure, both in rest and at motion, the applications that use that data are 100% are secure. And the most important thing which people always forget is the vast majority of, of security problems come because of human error. So one of the things that we'll see AI doing is create a lot of automation in the management of this infrastructure and that innovate that automation will actually reduce and we are at the forefront for all of our data centers are leveraging autonomous technologies uh, this means that we minimize human interaction we minimize the potential of human error so that's that's the whole idea of security uh, you you mentioned fraud and and the move to cloud so let me let me hit that just very quickly Please. Uh, so so in, in my view, there was generally a little bit of reticence uh, from, from the banking community on, on the cloud. Uh, and, and they had reasonably good reasons for that, right? They had the notion of data security and privacy that the regulators looked at very tightly. Uh, then you added that you added on data residency requirements. You know there are a number of uh, issues around letting the data of your citizens, in, including their financial information, travel around the world or travel in areas that are away from where uh, they can personally secure it right. and be accountable for it. So cloud had some, some headwinds. So what we saw move early to the cloud was just infrastructure as a service. So we saw you know, test and development environments, peak loads for, for non-mission critical applications. That was the first thing to go. The next thing was other applications like you know, human capital management, financial management. So they were, th that was the progression. Now we are seeing that core banking applications, things that are the core operating technologies for the bank, they have started to move to the cloud. And I think there's a number of things driving that. In, in COVID, we saw the number of digital customers go 3X uh, and number of digital transactions go 6X. Now, if you see that kind of volume, you can't track what you just experienced this morning, which was mm. fraud, right? How do, you, how do you have enough human beings to monitor and then investigate this huge volume of transactions. And the bad actors use this kind of advanced technology to perpetrate those, those, those cr criminal activities. So banks have to adopt large scale computing environments, artificial intelligence to start to combat those issues. And for that, they need to start to leverage cloud technologies mm -hmm. to be able to burst the capacity, et cetera. There's a lot of chatter in the community. So those companies, that really only play on-prem, uh, talk about how the cloud is so expensive. Those companies that are only playing the cloud talk about how the cloud is so cheap. You're, yeah. bo you're in both. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things people may not understand about Oracle is every single data center <clears throat> in Oracle, its entire cloud is identical. Yeah. The hardware, the software, the middleware, the processes, they're all the same. Yeah. 
So why is that important? That's important because that drives cost down. It drives efficiency. You guys have the autonomous database and now it's 23 AI. And so you're driving a lot of automation there. Uh, how much of a factor is, is cost and how much of a delta do you see? Is it pretty comparable? Um, I'm sure there are other considerations, especially when you get into AI. I'm interested in what you're seeing with, you know, everybody talks about large language models and then there's small language models that are specific to your data. You don't want to share it with the LLM vendor. Exactly. <clears throat> so two questions. What are you seeing on cost, cloud versus on-prem? And how are customers thinking about their private data? Are they putting it into the cloud? Do they want it to be on-prem? How do you see that? So, so um, that's, that's actually a superb question and let me answer that in sequence. So firstly, I believe cost is a factor from two different angles. In general, when you look at a cloud provider who's doing things at scale and at a kind of a factory setting, if they're not able to drive down your cost, it's kind of meaningless, right? The whole, I mean, cloud gives you probably two or three key benefits. One is the speed at which feature, feature density becomes available to you. You know, all these big cloud companies are, are innovating and they can roll out that feature to you a lot faster than you actually bringing that over into your data center, deploying it, testing it, you offload that. Secondarily, it's the, it's the cost factor, the scale that a cloud provider can bring you is definitely uh, something that uh, you, you, you can take advantage of. I think Oracle has two or three very key advantages in this space. One is we actually, when we built our, our second generation cloud, we use some very unique technologies and, and that has allowed us to deliver uh, compute, at a, compute and networks and storage at a very, very uh, aggressive price point. Mm -hmm. and, and as we move into the world of AI, where running these large language models, running inferencing from that large uh, language models is super expensive, even a fractional change in cost makes a huge difference to your customer. Mm -hmm. So we are very much uh, you know, at an advantage in that regard, given our, our uh, what we call generation, next generation uh, uh, cloud infrastructure. Secondarily, our obsession with security. I mean, we are definitely you know, kind of the, uh, the hallmark of security in this, in this industry. The third thing is we have mission critical workloads. So core banking, core retail merchandising, core, core telephony, uh, you know, uh, core applications for health, the most demanding workloads are testing our software, testing our cloud infrastructure, and that actually makes us uniquely differentiated in the marketplace because we get to experience our customers' problems because we are building not only infrastructure for them, but actual business capabilities. Yeah, financial services, healthcare, and three-letter agencies are the three probably most demanding. intense when it, yeah, demanding most when it demanding. comes to security. Yeah. I saw a note from your, your folks sent me over a note uh, last night that Oracle named the leader for AI for the risk and finance industry. And so I'm interested in how banks are thinking about that. Our data shows a couple things. I'll, sh I'll share it with you, see what you, you see. Um, our, we have a survey partner, ETR, based in NYC. They, they show that 45% of customers tell us that to fund Gen AI, they're stealing from other budgets. Um, it's probably not as acute in the financial services industry, but broadly it is. And then the, the, the second thing is their number one concerns are things like you know, privacy, security, legal, and compliance. It's yeah. almost like that used to be an afterthought yeah. and it was bolted on. Now you can't really do much without getting sign off from yeah. say legal. What are you seeing in financial services? Oh, financial services has that problem in orders of magnitude, to be honest, especially the regulatory element that you that you referred to. So, um, you know, I, and and we are building to that. So, I, I'll give you I'll give you an example. So, when you when you are in the debt collection business, so you're you're lending, you need to collect on your debts. So, the FDCPA, which is uh, an act that was created specifically for the collection of debt, uh, absolutely. Uh, outlines the type of language and sentiment that a debt collector can use when trying to collect uh, debt. And they are very heavy fines for violating those, those policies. So how did this happen earlier? You had, to, you had to monitor every call and make sure that you know, a supervisor was watching a debt collector till they went up the experience curve, and even then they had to spot check. Now with generative AI, 
you can actually monitor every call uh, and start to identify sentiment or tone and see if it is in violation of the regulations. And you can provide feedback very quickly to the collection agent and say, this is where you could have gone wrong. You can create a training uh, program for them. And supervisors can look at multiple agents and see how their overall uh, groups are functioning, what kind of incentives are required. So this is a classic situation where Gen AI solves a real problem. I mean, the others are, you know, making sure that you get more personalized, um, uh, you know, products uh, and experiences when you're interacting with the bank. You could be doing this in financial crime, in, in, in souping up your investigation capabilities. So the number of applications are tremendous, but understanding the models, making sure you're following fair lending practices, fair collection practices, this is gonna be a part and parcel of deploying these models, and regulators will continue to take a keen interest in all of this. I um, went down into your little coffee uh, area this morning was talking to some of your customers. I mean, was, these are business people. Yeah. Right? They're not like, they're not geeking out. I mean, yeah. I love to geek out. Uh, uh, but so, but I love the intersection of technology and business and that, cause that's what it's all about. How do you apply that technology to create a business outcome? So, uh, so, uh, but, but I'm super excited about the future and here's why. And I want to geek out a little bit and then get your reaction in terms of the business impact. So if you think about Oracle and its stack, I mean, other than semiconductors pretty much has everything. Yeah. And of course you have strong partnerships with many semiconductor companies. Yep. But the idea of, and I heard this at Cloud World, the ability to take all the data that's locked inside of applications, the data, the metadata, uh, the business logic, through Fusion, it's harmonized. You guys just did some hard work over the years to do that. But now I can serve that up to agents. Yep. We heard at Cloud World, you guys announced you promised to have 51 agents, many of which are in your space, yep. which is super exciting. So a lot of people talk about co-pilots or maybe single agents. Yeah. We're talking here about multiple agents working together, acting on that harmonized data to create a business outcome driven by top-down goals. You might yep. have metrics that say, okay, we want to grow market share. So we're, we, we're willing to take some price you know, concessions or you know, we want to maximize profit, so we're not, we don't want to cut price, et cetera. Whatever it is, top down, but then connect to that backend data to create a bottom-up outcome, agents working together in harmony. It's a long-term vision. It's not here today, but you've got the pieces to do that. How are you talking to customers about the future and applying AI? Are they thinking in those terms? Do they, do they see the potential to completely reinvent their businesses around new workflows and drive new levels of productivity? Or is it more kind of day-to-day -day battles? What are you seeing in the field? I don't see how they cannot be thinking about it. To be very honest, I gave you just one example, which is how do you, how do you manage fraud and the investigation of fraud if your transactions are growing 6x? I'll give you, I'll give you an example of what we, in terms of agents, we just uh, released an adversarial agent to the market today, as a matter of fact. And the ad what the adversarial agent does is it acts like a bad actor and tries to break your uh, money laundering um, uh, protections, right? Okay. So it comes in behaving like a bad actor and it tests all your scenarios and settings and it tries to get through them and it finds all the weak points and, 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 uh, and, and gives you the opportunity to go address them. Now, this is, this is what I mean by how can you not be thinking about this? Because trust me, the people who are trying to break into your system, they're not just criminals. They could be state actors. Mm. They could be people with unlimited funding and unlimited access to the best technology, the most transformative technology of today, right? So you ha that's what you're up against. And you're protecting your customers. You're protecting citizens in the country that you're operating in. And so... I don't know how, I, I can't see how you don't think about this. So from our standpoint, the best way we are doing this is to actually leverage our business applications, our core operating applications, build in the UI, uh, the AI use cases that I just described and showcase them to customers and make it easier for them to adopt. And the cost structure around this, you know, if you don't have an, a, a single-minded focus on that, you can make the cost of inferencing so expensive that your customers will be disinclined to use it. 
So for us, the cost advantage that I mentioned earlier is of paramount importance. We want to make sure that customers not only can leverage the data locked inside their, data, their enterprise, but all external data and come out with outcomes at a price point that makes the ROI useful. And the reason we can do that well is because of our next generation cloud and our experience with all these business that applications. That red stack stocks at an all time high. You've got all the pieces. Of course, financial services is, is a key harbinger of the future. Sunny Singh, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. My pleasure. Thank Great you so much you. for having me here. You're very welcome. All right, keep it right there. For our next guest, this is Dave Vellante for theCUBE at NYSE with NYSE Wired. We'll be right back right after this short break. <laughs>